Hi. Hi, Hello. Michael. Hi, I'm just waiting for some people to join. Uh, just bear with me a minute. I don't know why I made this uh, blunder here that I have um, that I have to be accepted manually. Just bear with me a minute here. Um, hold on a second. Okay, yeah, I think I'm cool. Okay, okay, right. Phew. Um, okay, so uh, thank you, guys. Uh, thank you, Tomas, for coming. Um, you know, uh, 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 T Moss as well. Thank you so much, and and George as well. You know, really grateful that you guys came. Um, I have tried my best here today to do something a bit different. Okay, so um, rather than just talk about uh, like how to look at a balance sheet and how to look at fundamentals, uh, rather than uh, just hold on, a second, yeah, rather than focusing on those kind of how to look for financials um i'm gonna i'm reading a book uh it was i like to read uh some stuff that uh, bill gates recommends on his uh inside the notes uh blog he kind of puts up a few books every quarter and i kind of go through them um i've read quite a few of those books because i found that sometimes finding an interesting book is kind of difficult you have to kind of um, you have to read a lot of different things. And he, so far, I've had a really high success rate with the stuff that he's recommended. I haven't been disappointed with anything that he's highlighted. So I kind of got this book um, about the grid. It's called The Grid. Uh, it was published in 2017. So, you know, 2007, that's six years ago. Now, at the time, I suspect the book was quite advanced in its theories about the, the energy transition. It's not that the energy transition hasn't been taking place. It has been taking place for a long, long time. And I'm going to go through that in the talk today. But it very neatly ties together what I'm trying to describe to people. So I kind of, okay, I picked this book up. And it's, it's a bit of a challenging book. Uh, it's not the most kind of a, like fluent going book. But it ties together some things that I believe are quite important. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the electrical grid. Then I'm going to talk about some of the problems right now that there are with this whole energy transition. And then I'm going to come to the punchline. So I'm going to give the punchline straight away uh, because I think that it's important to tie up the theory with the practical. So um, whenever I've done these talks, it was actually Thomas's uh, idea. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Uh, um, cool, man. Um, so he suggested to me, you know, uh, I think he must have some kind of uh, consulting business or something like that because his idea was really good. He was like, okay, don't just kind of talk about the theory where she was, she, but kind of, you know, tie back to something that is practical and actionable. So in these talks that we've talked in the past several weeks, they kind of talk about, oh, you know, look at this financial, you can see this with uh, BlackBerry, and I've talked about different businesses. So that whenever possible, I kind of add my own companies in here. But, you know, if it's not possible, because if I'm talking about some businesses doing something dodgy, because I don't own a business that is dodgy, I hope, at least, you know, I don't know about it. Uh, I kind of say about something else that I've seen. But in this example, I'm going to talk about um, uh, UEC, Uranium Energy Corp, and I'm going to talk about Ontario Resources, the natural gas producer. So this is like the punchline, and then I'm going to kind of go back a little bit, and I'm going to talk about a tiny, tiny bit of theory, add some context to kind of put this all together, and then kind of go and progress to the practical aspect. Okay, so... Um, at the start of this all is uh, electricity, okay? So electricity is very much about us taking anything that we want, whether it's to charge our cars or to run a data center or to do analytics, everything runs off electricity. So there's this movement, there's this trend towards electrifying everything, okay? So in your house, you, uh, you electrify your heating system, you electrify... Uh, your mobile, your laptops, whatever. There's this whole trend, okay? 
And there's also the trend towards consumer electronics that have smart technology on them. So for example, you may have a Fitbit or something like that. So this is a, this is a trend towards um, electrifying everything. Now, the way the electricity works is that it is produced at one point and it's used simultaneously at another point, okay? So I didn't remember this uh, from my physics lessons, but essentially the way that electricity goes is not that it's necessarily in the most direct way. You might remember like decades ago from like your physics lessons, that it doesn't necessarily go in the most direct way. It goes through the path of least resistance. So whenever you're at home and you turn on your uh, lamp on your in a house, what you're doing is you're removing that resistance and by removing the resistance, the electricity goes there and the light comes on. So that's, you know, I'm, I'm, it's not about physics, but essentially when we kind of change the resistance, it changes where the electricity goes. Now, you have um, these electrical grids everywhere, all around the country. And we produce energy in a place and we, uh, use it elsewhere. Now, at this moment in time, the majority of our energy comes from either uh, coal or natural gas to, to a large extent. There may be, depending on where you live, there might be some hydropower uh, and there may be some nuclear. The idea of a migration towards net zero depends on the country. Some countries have 2030, some have 2035, but essentially there's a movement towards net zero. And this movement is led by us attempting to decarbonize our energy sources. So this is like a big phrase, but all it means is that we're trying to cut back how much we use fossil fuels. We are trying to use more renewable energy. The two main sources of renewable energy are wind turbines and solar panels. Now, when we add these uh, renewable sources to our grid, it presents a problem because, as I said at the start, energy is produced and it's used instantaneously elsewhere. Okay, so if you add, let's say there's a lot of wind, so these wind turbines are blowing, 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 and they're spinning, 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 produces a lot of energy. That energy needs to be go somewhere because it's produced and sent straight away somewhere. Now. The grid needs to embrace or take in that energy. So it's a variable amount of energy coming in because it's a blast of wind. So this is what you need to take away. I'm not going to overcomplicate this, but essentially energy is that's renewable energy is added to the grid and it must be used somewhere. Okay. So this is the free part system. It must be used somewhere and for it to be used at a time that is convenient to you, the best way of going about it is to store that energy by energy storage, thinking lithium batteries, like large lithium batteries, okay? So at this moment in time, when there's a lot of energy going into the system, at this moment in time, there's not enough storage capacity, okay? In the future, there may be, because you may be using more electric vehicles, there may be uh, other ways that you can kind of absorb that energy, but at this moment in time, there isn't. So that causes a problem. It's like a, a chicken or an egg situation because you want to have a lot of renewables, you want to have this green energy source, but once you add that to the grid, the grid needs to do something with it. And unless there's the energy way of storing that, it just, it, it malfunctions. So uh, the book, this the book, The Grid, talks about in 2003 in the US, there was a blackout that took out two days, 50 million people were um, uh, affected by this. So <clears throat> what's happening is that when the electrical grid is taking on too much energy, it needs to protect itself. So it trips the wires, like in your house, you may have some wire tripping. If there's like a, a surge somehow, uh, I, I, I don't know if you guys do, but I, in my house, I kind of, some of the, like the, the fridge freezer kind of put a little device there next to the plug. So if there's like a surge, it kind of protects it. You don't want it to fry up your, your stuff. Um, so you might be familiar with that, like, or you may turn on the fuse box in your house at some point. So 
this these trip wires to protect anything from kind of malfunctioning. So the problem with having renewables, if you forget about the fact that you have to um, build the renewables, the problem with the renewables is that when all that energy comes in, you don't really know how to store that energy. So it causes a problem because it may give you that energy at a time you don't need. The second problem here that the book talks about, and I don't think this is practical whatsoever, is that uh, certain uh, US government bodies have suggested ways of mitigating the peak demand of energy. We need a lot of energy during the day. We may not need so much at night. How can we, how can we modulate or how can we moderate the amount that we need so we don't have so much peak during the day, but you kind of maybe charge your electrical vehicle at night or you run some servers at night? How do we do that? I don't think that's really practical, changing the way that people do stuff. I never, I never believed that you can retrain somebody. So the alternative, I believe at least in my idea, is that we stick with the status quo. So I, you know, where, the, the way that Warren Buffett has often made uh, his returns is not betting that something is going to change in the future because that's difficult. Forecasting is often difficult. The way that he has attempted to do that is betting on the status quo. So um, so when I wrote uh, my blog, I think it was um, last Friday, I talked about, oh, these are the tech, top 10 companies that were around in the year 2000. And I talked about Microsoft being in the year 2000 and in 2020. And he said, okay, on your list, on the top 10, um, Exxon is also in the top 10 there and is also on the top 10 now. And this made me think, you know what? That is true. There are certain things that provided that there's enough demand they will stick around for a while. So in this example was about energy. And then it made me think about what the way that Warren invests. So when Warren is investing in a business, he's just betting that things will remain the same. So obviously he talks about newspapers, newspapers being a good way historically because you'd be in a town with only two newspapers and it's either you or the other person and you kind of, largely competing for the same eyeballs, there's not a lot of possibility for a new entrant to come in. So his other examples, like say Coca-Cola or something, it's, it's about things just keeping along in the status quo. Now, when it comes to uh, investing in energy, obviously this is my thesis. So my thesis is at this moment in time, these businesses in the energy sector are really cheaply valued. Most of them priced at approximately six, seven times free cash flow. I believe, in fact, that something like Ontario Resources is slightly cheaper than this. I think it's around four times free cash flow. But that's very much dependent on where the price of natural gas will be next year. But so let me add some margin of safety and let me say, okay, you know what? Um, I don't know what the price of natural gas is going to be. Let's kind of, you know, let's look at an average around four dollars. That's kind of like a, a reasonably long-term average. Uh, so if it goes around that price, what is the valuation that I'm paying for this company? Now, the bet here, when I'm betting, let's say, for example, Vantera Resources, is that everyone believes that things will stay as they are, but I believe the demand for natural gas is going to increase. And the reason why I believe the demand for natural gas is going to increase is what we just discussed. There's going to be more need for energy in terms of we are no longer going to be charging, uh, sorry, um, fueling our cars with oil. We're going to charge them from our houses. And this is going to lead to massive demand in of electricity. And I talked about this as well with the case with, with data centers and AI and analytics. This is very, very energy intensive. So there's going to be more need for electrifying everything. And to electrify things, I don't believe that in the near term, the ability of renewables to install into the grid is going to actually um, become a reality. I very much believe that that can last several years, it can last, uh, let's say five or six years, at some point it will start to incrementally come in. 
but in the like in the nowish kind of looking out over the next 12 months 12 to 18 months i very much believe that there's going to be the need for more natural gas and the need for more um nuclear power and this um when it comes to this kind of energy transition that everyone talks about these things take a really long time and i talked about uh, before so in the year 2000 86 percent of the energy that we consumed around the world 86 percent came from fossil fuels we for 20 odd years have been on this transition towards net zero we kind of been trying to cut back on the amount of energy that we get from fossil fuels and it stands right in 2022 so it's it's a year outdated 83 percent so in the 20 years we've only managed to displace about three percent of the energy that we get from fossil fuels incidentally it appears that the countries that have the most coming from renewable energy have actually got the highest energy costs uh, europe uh, predominantly germany um so it kind of there's a mismatch the way for an economy to flourish the us does this really really well is to have access to really really cheap electricity and the energy really so this is my idea that as more and more countries seek to expand the amount of energy that uh, they take in there's going to be there's not going to be as much coming from renewables as many people believe that's going to take a lot longer so i really believe that looking out to next year there's going to be a lot more demand for energy and the reason for that is two things firstly i kind of talked about this quite a few times already in 2024 lng terminals are going to come online at the back end of next year and that's going to lead to more natural gas being taken out of the us and shipped to europe and uh, and asia and even you know like latin america and stuff like that you know mexico uh, so th there's going to be a lot of demand for that cheap natural gas and the way to so it's basically a, 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 an arbitrage because in the US, price of natural gas is really, really cheap and elsewhere it's quite expensive. So there's going to be an ability to ship that out coming online next year. So if the price of natural gas in the US comes up, I believe a reasonable way to invest is, for example, Antero because they are unhedged. This means that they don't have... Um, a pre-contracted price that they're going to sell. They're just going to sell whatever the, is the spot market. And typically, you don't want to do that if you're a commodity business, unless you happen to be one of the lowest price commodity producers, which Antero is. So Antero not only is one of the, the, the lowest uh, in terms of producing the natural gas, they also have one of the cleanest balance sheets. So if you have a clean balance sheet, that's your margin of safety. And if you are a low cost producer, that gives you just more staying power. This is something that I've talked about a lot in our discussions here on Tuesday is really thinking about you, when you invest, you want to invest and stay with the business and you want to stay on your terms. What you don't want to happen as it's happening in other sectors right now, as we speak, is that the market kind of goes into a bit of a, you know, a quote unquote risk off period. And you're kind of scratching your head. Oh, did I overpay for this? You don't, you don't want any of that. You, what, like you, you don't want to, even if your business sells off, which often businesses do, you want to be able to stick with it so that in three or four months, when things stabilize a little bit, you have stay in power. And by having, you know, a very clean balance sheet, and a business that is able to um, be a low cost operator, you, you, you're positioning yourself for being able to stay with that, provided that you don't pay a very large multiple. And, you know, everybody wants uh, these kind of businesses that have a lot of pricing power. That's why uh, software businesses typically trade at a very large premium, but kind of the secret is out there. And that's why those software businesses often trade at really, really high multiples because people expect them to have pricing power.
and you know it kind of becomes like a a, a, a virtual circle. People expect to have pricing power, therefore they trade a premium. But in the case of these businesses, let's say like uh, Antero Resources and Uranium Energy Corp, people don't have a high expectations for them. In fact, as I've been discussing, you know, with you guys for several weeks now that the price of uranium is, is really moved really high. And these stocks, yes, they have come up a little bit, but, you know, I was looking for, um, a, you know, on Google Analytics, sometimes you can look at trends. And I kind of looked at this trend, like uh, um, mentions of uranium or mentions of nuclear energy. And it's basically like a flat line, like nothing has really happened. So I, I'm very bullish and I kind of say, oh, look, 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 this is working, this is working right now. But more broadly speaking, nobody really following this sector. So until it becomes like everyone is following this sector and everyone is talking about it, and you can you can always tell a lot about how much in demand that um, that particular stock is by how many people write about it on Seeking Alpha. If you'll, everybody's writing about it every like Tesla every single day, like seven eight articles, you can tell okay, every, like the secret is out. Uh, but you look at something like Uranium Energy Corp, and there's like hardly anyone writing about it. Uh, so, you know, um, I'm not saying that, you know, um, I'm not saying necessarily that this is like the best time to buy or this is not a good time or whatever. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying, okay, there's time, you know, like, and like everybody, when it comes to investing, nobody wants to, to wait around, you know, like people want like to get paid. And I get that. You're like, I want to get paid. Everyone wants to get paid. But like, it just it's important to kind of take a step back and think, okay, yeah, the share price is going up a little bit right now uh, with Uranium Energy Corp. Um, but if you look at it, you know, if you just wait until this time next year and we're looking at, let's say, the back end of 2024, does it really matter too much that the share price is going up a little bit right now? I know that that kind of perhaps caps some of the upside in the very near term, but it's really difficult to kind of time the market. And I, I have seen that, time and time again, that you look at a share price and it's like, okay, that share price is going up and then it can continue going up for like much, much longer. You, like it's difficult to know what is a reasonable multiple and it's much easier. And that's why, you know, Warren does really, really well is just, he has this tremendous amount to be patient. Now I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not as patient and I'm not as successful as Warren, but that, that you, there's some principles that a person can take away. So he's kind of giving you that template and you you know you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can just say, okay, this is a kind of reasonable, easy, understandable concept. Just try and be a bit patient. And as long as the fundamentals continue, all is hunky dory. Um, yeah. So that's my kind of long spiel. And um, I know it was a bit kind of theoretical, but I, I I felt that it was kind of interesting to kind of talk about this whole renewable energy aspect. Uh, oh, thank you, Tomas. Um, yeah, so I like as I said, you know, um, I'm I'm very happy to kind of chat to you guys and kind of you know take like us to discuss some stuff. Uh, it doesn't have to be about the grid or the, like energy or renewables. I'm happy about that. Um, anything you guys want to chat about? Michael. Hiya. Uh, T Moss here. Energy is always thought of as a cyclical industry that you have to trade. Yeah. Obviously, Ontario went to forty dollars back in two or three years ago. Then it went all the way back down to the low twenties, mm -hmm. and now is recovering. But the fact is that Wall Street still thinks of energy as a cyclical type situation. What you're saying almost makes it a secular trend mm -hmm. because it's going to be here longer. Can you comment on that and how? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I would just say one thing. And you're absolutely correct, 100% correct. I agree with you, you know, everything. The only thing I would just unpick there is that energy is cyclical, but energy, there's oil, which everyone thinks about energy, thinks about oil. I really try and avoid oil. There are times when oil looks like, oh my God, all these companies are amazing, they're, they're gushing loads of uh, free cash flow and dividends and blah, blah. But oil is like it's like it's really killer and that's what i was trying to say at the beginning i don't know if i kind of put my point across for a while probably didn't uh when it comes to charging your cars that's going to be charged 
with natural gas. So at this, I don't know where you live, but like at this moment in time, most people go to the petrol pump and they put oil in their car and the car goes somewhere. So there's a disruption. I, I hate these kind of Silicon Valley words, but it's, it, is, it is what it is, okay? So there's a disruption where people no longer need to fill up their cars with petrol and they're going to need to charge their cars with natural gas because, you know, we had talked about at the start, it's kind of difficult to get the renewables in there. So I'm not saying, look, I'll be honest with you, and to the best of my knowledge, um, I don't think that there's any sector that's a forever a secular grower. Everyone thinks about, let's say, you know, I own also Alphabet, Google, uh, and everyone thinks about these are kind of, oh, it's a secular winner, secular winner. But everything looks like a secular winner until it's not. You're much better thinking about it as, okay, there is a trend here that may last, let's say, two years, and then we'll kind of see how it goes. But everything is cyclical. So everything is cyclical. Okay, so there is no such thing as forever and ever. Okay, particularly in commodities, it's always boom and bust. High prices kill high prices, and low prices cure low prices. So it's always like this, this. But what's adding some fundamentals to Ontario, in my opinion, is that there is an arbitrage because prices in uh, Europe are about five times more expensive than prices in the US. There is no logical reason for that, aside from there's not enough storage facilities in Europe to take all that LNG cargo. Now, that is a present problem that has been in place since uh, the U uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, and everyone knows about this. So they're trying to uh, not only take as much LNG cargo, but increase the amount of storage capacity that they can have so that we, uh, you know, Europe is not as contingent on getting cargo from Russia. Now, incidentally, I should note the irony of all this war is that, in fact, although we don't get that, Europe doesn't get that much LNG from Russia, it's actually taking slightly more LNG from Russia after the war started than before the war. Um, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't care about the politics. I'm just talking about the fact that the demand for electricity, I believe, is what I'm chasing here, that, that people will need more electricity. Now, I agree wholeheartedly. These things uh, that I'm talking about, I do think that there's this kind of secular demand. But the point I'm trying to make is that nobody, in my opinion, is paying for that secular demand. And I'll just add one more thing, if you allow me. Back in 2019, 2020, a lot of these uh, natural gas companies had very leveraged balance sheets. So when you have a leveraged balance sheet and your commodity price drops precipitously, you end up in a havoc. It's absolute hell. Companies go bankrupt. It's, it's That's the commodity cycle. But the reason why I'm saying that, you know, I know those are kind of cliche words, but this time is different is because those balance sheets of those companies, particularly uh, Antero, balance sheet is really, really strong. So that's what I was trying to say at the start. You want things that are staying power. Like, I know it was not your question, but I'll just for one more second, just explain something else. So when I saw it said about a Uranium Energy Corp, everyone says, oh, uh, this UEC company, this guy is like self-promotional, blah, blah, blah. And it is true. The business has been around since 2007 and they went for a nuclear winter. They had to sell, it, it, it dilute the shareholders to get cash in so the balance sheet could be debt free because that's your staying power. They didn't know that in 2023, uh, uranium prices would increase and they'll be able to start production soon. They didn't know that like for 12 years, there's been a nuclear winter and nobody knew that. So it was like survival of the fittest. Only those businesses that were able to do the operations in the level that would allow them to stay have stayed here. So again, just, just to conclude, nothing lasts forever. No trend goes forever up, but you're not paying for that. You're paying like four or five times free cash flow for uh, Antero. And you know, it's you're not paying like crazy multiples.
one, one last question to follow up on Ontario. Uh, the balance sheet, uh, I think they have uh, some debt, some little bit left in 27 and 28. It's definitely unleveraged. Why do you, what would you say about uh, the question whether they, I know they've been buy, buying back shares, but how about the dividend? They have, do you think that that would help the stock price if they uh, went ahead and uh, so declared I, a dividend? I, you know, I, I would just love the dividend. I would love, 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 love the dividend. Not because I care about the dividend, but because everyone else cares about the dividend. But I'll be honest with you, I, I don't believe that they will give a dividend. And the reason why they won't give a dividend is because if, if for what, uh, sorry, my connection is cutting out, just wait a second. So they don't give a dividend is if for whatever reason they cut the dividend, the share price would get absolutely slammed. So it's much better for them to just repurchase those shares steadily over time. And remember, so, if they repurchase their shares by just say, for example, 10%, that's kind of approximately 500 million shares, uh, 500 million dollars uh, um, that uh, whatever the share price is. So that would mean that next year, even if nothing, everything stays the same, the EPS would increase by 10%. So or even if no progress, just by them sticking like just in the same place at the same time, with the same commodity price, just by them repurchasing share shares, their earnings per share would increase by 10%. And, you know, investors would, would welcome that. Now, the pitch that I'm making is that things don't stay the same and things actually improve. But even if they just stay the same, it just allows the business to repurchase shares and the earnings per share will go up and people will, would pay a higher multiple for that. I can tell you for certain. It, yes, the dividend is important and the dividend would uh, add a lot of uh, shareholders that would not be willing to sell, that would be more sticky, but you don't need that. And uh, just to take this to the other extreme, I know it's not the same, but just to take this to the other extreme, you see something like Berkshire Halfway, they don't pay a dividend, they just compound over time. So I'm not saying that Antero is like anything like that, but I'm just saying, yeah, dividends are cool, but it's not the only thing. All right, let me ask you, I, I'm, I don't want to bogart this situation, but uh, getting back to UEC, uh, uranium, I believe, is over $60 now. At $60, $65 uranium, they ought to be made, able to make some terrific money. Is that is that correct? So I'll be honest. I don't feel that they would make terrific money. I think that they will make some money. And the, right. reason, and the reason... I, I, so, so let me just back up a second. Uh, actually... The price of uranium is closer to 70, just above 70, I should think, right now. Uh, right. So it's actually higher. But they need some months of it to stay at this price before they reopen their production. So their production has been closed for more than 10 years. So they obviously need to hire people. They need to train people. This get regulation going. You know, this is going to take time. This is not to say it won't happen. It's just that it's not going to oh, $70 uranium, let's go, everyone's singing and dancing. But, you know, the market is always forward-looking. So provided that things stay at this price and stay stably at this price, they can start going on and they can start hiring and they start training. It's really difficult to train people to deal with this kind of stuff, uranium, because like nobody really wants to mess around with it. So it does take time, but th that doesn't detract from the story. The story is very much intact. All right. One one last question from me, and I'm going to shut up. Uh, Cameco, uh, always thought of as the leader in the uranium industry, probably. Their purchase of Westinghouse, which was basically a, a broke company. Uh, w give me your opinion on that and how that, that's, that uh, merger is transitioning. And is it going to be favorable in the long run to Cameco to be more vertically integrated? So it's a different uh, type of idea. So Cameco has a great advantage. Cameco, by you, your words, I agree, it's going to be vertically integrated. What this means is they're more diversified, so they're less of a pure play on uranium. The advantage of that is if the uranium 
uh, prospects fizzle out, Cameco is going to be just fine. And I'll add one more layer on top of that. The Cameco hedges their production. Um, they have a sensitive sensitivity table on their annual report. Um, I'm going to, I don't know, I think it's page 20, but I can't remember the page precisely, but you can just type in sensitivity on the annual report and you get a little table there. And it's very simple, very easy to understand. You see that as the price of uranium goes up, they, they kind of hedge it off. So even if the price goes above 70, they don't really make a lot more that, 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 than they do at 60. They kind of, they have a, 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 a bottom and a top that they kind of, Within that range, they kind of make some, make a bit more, make a bit less, but they're very much of a hedge production. Now that's great because if you if you don't have any kind of negative news coming, if you're highly diversified and you're in the right story, hedge funds love that. A hedge fund doesn't need to kind of understand the price dynamics, nothing like that. Hedge funds just want to deploy capital as quickly as possible into the leader and no questions asked. Chemical is going to be their default go-to. So that's the primary one that's going to do reasonably well. Now, I believe very much in the Iranian story. So I'm looking for something that is unhedged. So it's the same idea really as with Ontario, is that if the price of uranium remains relatively strong, demand for nuclear energy starts to kind of improve on the edges, this would lead to something like UEC to do really, really quite well. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions for a couple of minutes? Well, <clears throat> does your, I, I know you, um, I asked you before and, and you're a, a long and steady as she goes investor. Uh, if the price of natural gas, let's say all of a sudden hits 450, does that, does that, and the, and the stock of AR uh, spikes, do you, do you ever sell and then buy back or you just, no, no, you just keep, no. keep, 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 keep. No, I don't want to keep forever, but these are two kind of stocks that I will keep for a while. There's other things that I'm going to, that I feel, okay, you know, I, it's kind of done okay. You don't need to faff around anymore. But these are two, until everybody's talking about the energy transition, that the renewable um, hasn't really worked out, and that natural gas and uranium are going to be the default complementary energy sources for the electrical grid. Until that's like, everybody's talking about it, I'm like, uh, you know, I'll just stick around for a little bit. Okay, thank you. That's a really good question. Thank you. Um, okay, everyone, thank you so much uh, for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, and Thomas as well, thank you for the questions. Uh, and yeah, um, and, and Timos as well, everyone, like, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, so thank you Michael. Thank you so much.